Good morning and welcome. As uh, we just heard, now is the time to worship. Will you come and join us in that time of bringing our love, our gratitude, our praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, before we begin the worship time, will you just grab your bulletins? I hope you got one as you came in. And I'd like to just highlight a few things. And first is, uh, I'm going on vacation. And uh, there's, a, there's a meme out there on the internet that says, uh, come and join us, our pastor's on vacation. And uh, so if people want to do that, I hope they, more would come in, even though the pastor's on vacation. But uh, uh, I'm going to take a break uh, for two weeks. Some will say, what are you going to do? Well, one week staycation, some day things and some projects around the house. And then the second week, we're going to go to the uh, area of Huntington, Juniana, uh, Raystown. And we're uh, using a family member's uh, home out there for that. So we may be kayaking. We may be doing some other things that we've never done together as a family. So we appreciate your prayers for a safe time, a good time, a refreshing time, and coming back and uh, being with you again. So uh, also on Wednesday evenings, we've gone out three night, three Wednesday nights, and we've already now gone to 510 homes. And what's that mean going to? Uh, we walk uh, the neighborhoods. Uh, we pray for each home as we come to it. And as we walk on the property to hang a door hanger, there's samples out here you can see posted out here out near the resource table along with a, a map that uh, the highlighted areas are where we've been already. And about 510 in, in three weeks with an average of going from three people to seven or eight people at times out there. So uh, we invite you. It's a very simple ministry. Yeah, it's been some hot evenings, but God's been good. And um, the neighbors have been very nice to us. Again, we don't ring a doorbell knock. We just put a door, uh, door hanger on there that says we've prayed for you. We're praying for your community. And if you have any prayer uh, need, things that we can pray for, please contact us. So that's where we are. And we believe that's the start of an uh, entry to the gospel message coming to those homes. So if you'd like to help us do that and serve in that way, show up on Wednesday evening at 6.30. Yes, I'm gonna be away. That doesn't mean we're not gonna do it. We already have leadership in place to, to carry that out. The assignments have been chosen. Everything's ready. Just come and join us. We're usually about an hour and 15 minutes out in this whole ministry. So that's a lot of homes we tackle in a short time. And again, we pray that the Lord is leading us to the right neighborhoods and this neighborhoods that need the Lord. Uh, coming up, our annual baptismal service on Sunday, August 22nd at 3 in the afternoon at the home of Randy and Nancy Abel. And also, uh, there's a preparation class for that on Thursday, August 19th. So if you desire to be baptized, this is a way for a Christian to proclaim their faith and testimony in Jesus Christ uh, in, the in the act of ordinance and sacrament of baptism, we invite you to do so. So please contact me as soon as possible when you make that decision. Many other announcements, I'm going to ask you to read them and act upon them and pray for them. Also, a prayer, an update on your prayer list. Janet Waring, we had listed there, is at UPMC Hospital. She has been transferred as of Friday to Encompass, uh, which was formerly... Um, Health South Rehabilitation. It's now called Encompass uh, Hospital for Rehabilitation. So remember Janet and her daughter Nancy as they face these things. Uh, Janet is doing well. I hope she'll be home very shortly. And there are many other things to pray for in our church community So uh, and family. Please uh, lift up the body of Christ in prayer in our community. That's all the announcements. Again, uh, we are as a church gather to worship today. The month of August, our praise team takes off, okay, for the month. Then they regroup and come back in September. Uh, so we're going to have some different variety of uh, types of uh, services. Uh, possibly the next couple ones may be a praise songs of VBS style. 
So I'm going to talk to uh, Cammie and Pastor Chris, who will be filling the pulpit the next two Sundays, that they are going to coordinate something like that. Is that okay? Okay, I got a thumbs up. All right. So let's stand together. Stand. You may welcome one another in the manner you want. Respect social distancing. If some don't want to shake hands or hug, that's okay. But please greet one another. And let's then stand for our first song, 211, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> you wouldn't think it again. He wasn't in, I don't think. Okay, let's take our hymnals and turn to 211. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Now, this song's been around for quite a while, but I got introduced to it in 1993 at a missions conference called Urbana, and uh, it was uh, uh, definitely an impactful song to me, and I hope, again, it impacts you. As we celebrate, we proclaim the deep, deep love of Jesus that transforms our lives. 211. <laughs> Lord, we do come to celebrate your deep, deep love for us. You're so full of grace and mercy, a perfect love for us, Lord. 
and the love that we don't deserve. But because of your mercy, you shared to us. And you've done so much for us by your life, your death, your resurrection, the filling of your spirit in our lives. Lord, we just thank you. And Lord, may your spirit lead us in the worship you deserve. Lord, may you receive all honor, glory, and praise. Speak to us from your word and spirit today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Will you take your hymnals and turn to number 200? You'll find a responsive reading of scripture today. Number 200, and it's entitled God's Amazing Grace. And we'll read it responsively, and it starts with the people. So you'll start first. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen. And let us affirm our faith by together reciting the Apostles' Creed as you'll find it on the screen. Together. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's respond in song and worship. Number 406, my hope is in the Lord.
We're going to dismiss the children of Junior Church Ministries at this time, and we're going to continue to worship with number 206, There Is a Redeemer. Join me in praying. We're going to start with just a time of silent prayer. You may have had a tough week. You may have had a great week. Come and thank the Lord for his grace that sustained you, his truth that led you. Come and share your struggles, the temptations, the trials you face with him. Ask for his grace and power and truth to lead you, comfort you, transform you. Where he shows you your sin, confess and commit to repentance. After this time of silent prayer, I'll lead us. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. We are so thankful, Lord, 
that we can say there is a Redeemer and His name is Jesus. And that He came into our world, lived with us, taught us, loved us, then suffered and died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We deserve death. We deserve eternal separation from you because of our sinfulness and rebellion. For you are a holy God who calls and demands holiness. But you saw that we were helpless. So you sent a Redeemer to save us from death and sin and hopelessness. Instead, you gave us life, eternal life and relationship with you. You took the guilt and the shame away. You've called us to a new life to live. And we're to live as Christ. So Lord, help us to do that. Forgive us when we fail. And it's often. But lead us to repentance, holiness, righteousness. Transform us, Lord. Show us the way to live. May we find a joy in living for you and your plan for our lives. When we come as the body of Christ and we have needs, so we, we share them with you, Lord. You've heard prayers for forgiveness and we know you will forgive. We pray for you to restore those lives that have been damaged by sin. And we've been damaged by other people's sins. So, Lord, transform us and change us and comfort us as that is addressed. We come seeking answers to questions we have, searching for the path you have for us to live. Show us the way. Show us your wisdom and truth to live by. Help us to hear the Spirit and follow his leading. And some, Lord, they come with hurt, perhaps loss, grief, pain and suffering in mind, body, or soul. Touch them with your grace and power, Lord. Restore and heal. And now we come to the word Teach us the truth you have for us today as we read the book of Ruth together. As we discover more and more what redemption means, what grace means, and how you have sovereignty over all things and a providence of care for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. <clears throat> I'm coming down here with confidence that our audio system is all better. And if you're in the back or you came in the back and you see this kind of strange thing on a, uh, on a telescopic uh, stand, you're saying, who made that? Is that some kind of modern artwork we inherited somehow? No, it's, a, uh, it's an, antenna, an antenna that picks up my cordless mic without interference. We hope that we've gotten the right technology to get rid of that interference. It affects us here, but it also affects us online. Uh, you can still hear me when the mic cuts out. Those that, <clears throat> excuse me, online cannot hear me. So maybe sometimes you watched and say, can't hear him, 
can't hear him. I think Kelly Funk puts up once in a while. She'll say, can't hear you. And it's like, I can't see it until after the service, Kelly, but you can put it up there so Denny and others can see it and others can. We want your feedback on this, again, a new venture for us being online. And so we're live streaming, but there's a recording of it later on. If you miss a service, you can always go back and, and find us there on YouTube and Facebook. So greetings to those who are watching on Facebook at this time or will be watching later on YouTube. We welcome you again. We invite you to contact us. Let us know of your, your participation in worship with us. Uh, it's not the same as being here. We'd love to have you join us on a Sunday and uh, worship with us in person, but we're glad of your presence here. And uh, so, but before we begin even the, ser the sermon, we're going to again focus on uh, living by the word. It's our emphasis throughout the year. <clears throat> And uh, there's seven parts to living by the word, uh, application of the word, read it, study it, meditate it, memorize it, pray it, obey it, and share it. Those seven things really are involved. If you read the scriptures and about the word, that's what's involved there. And in a future sermon series, I'm going to take that apart, that living by the word and show the emphasis and application of each of those steps and each of those parts of being living by the word. So I've chosen, I told you, I promised you a shorter version of scripture, verses of scripture this month. So uh, one, thank you, brother. Yeah, I had one up there earlier. Thank you. Excuse me. So again, you have one verse. I'm not, you're not going to have a test for the next two weeks while I'm away. I'm going to let Pastor Chris focus on things that he needs to do, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to test you. So you should be really good at this, right? And it's a, I chose a verse that I think it, we really need to hear it and apply it as Christians. So read it together with me boldly and honoring God's word. James 1.26 those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Um, powerful uh, command and call to us to really watch our speech. And uh, is it uplifting? Is it encouraging? are always, always negative, critical, and harmful in our words. That's what you need to decide, I need to decide. So again, we're in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. We're ending our series today on Ruth. And um, I want to again emphasize, again, go back and read the book of Ruth together in one setting. We've taken it apart, we've analyzed it, looking for application, revelation about God, revelation about mankind, and all these things we do when we approach Scripture. But take one setting, it's only four short chapters, and just take a few moments and, and read through the whole context together. And just again, see how God is so sovereign, how He is so sovereign over our lives. And that, yeah, when we make even bad choices or bad things happens to us, God can bring good even out of the bad. And that's part of the story of, of Ruth is about, is that God, even when bad things happen, God can bring good about. Uh, God specializes in bringing good results, what appears to be bad times. So we're going to review a little bit of the first three chapters and then finish uh, the remaining chapter here again. So remember, uh, this is in the time, Ruth was in the time of uh, Judges, about 1200 B.C., and there was no king. Uh, Saul and David were going to be coming next. If you read the, the book of uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, we'll give you details of that. Uh, but there was no king, but there, the Lord raised up men and women that were called Judges, and uh, they were used by the Lord to move provoke the people come to come back to God. 
They were in a cycle of apostasy, we call it. They were falling away from the Lord. They would be there, a good relationship, everything, they're worshiping God. Then they got distracted, started following false gods and other things, and they would fall away. The Lord would bring discipline, judgment upon them, and then he would bring them back by a judge or a prophet would come, and they'd go back to living with God again in harmony but then they would start to cycle all over again. And that's where you find through the whole book of Judges. And you may say, nothing's really changed. You could see personal lives, nations, and peoples that we do the same thing. We go in a cycle. And we need to break that cycle. But that's a sermon for another time. But we're going to talk about grace changes everything. God's redemption changes everything. And so, we, again, we had the story of Naomi. And she was married to a man that they, her and her husband uh, and two sons, they were in Bethlehem. Then a famine hits, chapter 1. And they decide to move to a territory outside of Israel called Moab. And the, while they were there, their sons married two girls, Oprah and Ruth. While they are... Ruth, excuse me, Naomi's husband dies. We don't know why he just dies. No explanation. She's left a widow. A short time later, we would say, she loses both her sons. So she's a widower, and she's in a foreign land without any family, except these Moabite foreign women that her sons have married. Now, they were in, that's a rebellion. So the first thing we see is this is a bad circumstance. Now you may say, well, they were leaving a bad situation, a famine. Well, God told them that he was going to give them these famines because it was judgment against their rebellion. Read the book of Deuteronomy and the warnings there. So, But they moved to another area. They went to an area where they worshiped false gods and married women that were outside the Jewish People. So they're breaking all what God had told them. It was a bad thing. Then actually kind of changed. We start to see some hope for this situation for Naomi. She tells her daughter-in-laws, go home. Go home to your families. Find husbands. Start families. Start over. I have nothing to give you. Oprah, one of the Daughter-in-law, she goes home. Ruth, the other Moabite uh, widow of the sons, she says, I'm going home with you. I'm going home to Bethlehem. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. And your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. So we see some change for good here. We see a very committed daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. And I would say, if we can read between the lines, Ruth the Moabite, who used to worship foreign gods, now is worshiping Yahweh, the God of the Jews. So things are starting to look better. So they return back to Bethlehem. And you know, Naomi's heart is very bitter against God. She blames God for her bitter situation. Friends, God never makes you bitter. It is your reaction to things in life. But God will never make you bitter, okay? He'll make you better. He, want, he wants to change you. But he will not give you a bitterness. When your anger resides and festers in you, it's like a root, like a dandelion that goes deep down. And if you don't root it all out, it'll keep coming back. And I think that's what was happening with Naomi. And she gets to town and says, don't call me Naomi. Call me, call me Mara, right? Mara meaning bitter. She's bitter in spirit. I know I'm rehashing some of the things we've just done the last several weeks, but I want us to get all the way to the accumulation of this story. And so while they're there, the barley har harvest is beginning. Chapter 2 begins. And Naomi, excuse me, Ruth says, we need some food. We need to do something. So she goes out and asks Ruth, can I, um, Naomi, can I go 
to the fields and gleaned behind the harvesters. Whatever straps, scraps are left, I'll pick up and bring home, and that's our meals. And maybe we can sell the extra, things like that. Naomi says, go ahead. And she goes and into a fields, and she's blessed. Where she's welcome, she's protected. There's this guy named Boaz who owns the fields, right? Now we're starting to see the situation change better. Boaz is very gracious to Ruth. And there's an attraction, there's a romance that seems to be stirring. And she goes home to Naomi and tells all the things that happened in the field there and how blessed and, and she's been welcomed back. And Naomi says, he's a close relative. He's a close relative, this guy named Boaz. He's our relative. And so things are going. She says, go on back. And then Ruth, Naomi says, hey, clean up, right? Put on perfume, put on new clothes, and go and see him at night. And then there's like a proposal by Ruth to Boaz, let's get married. We have to read between the lines, but that's what was happening. Again, some good things are happening for people that had some bad things happen in their lives. And so... Boaz says, well, yeah, I can be the kinsman redeemer in your family. We learned that, that that's a close relative that assists a family member to help redeem something, to buy back. And there was land that Naomi had that needed to be bought back and brought into the family for a livelihood. And, and all land was supposed to be returned back to the family lines. But there's a guy that's closer than Boaz to do this. So he approaches him, and the long story short, the guy says, I can't do it. And remember last week we ended where there was like this weird thing with a sandal. He took a sandal off and handed it and said, now you, you're, it's your word, it's your, your issue, you're, you're going to commit to it. So Boaz becomes the, the kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth because with that redemption and everything, is a marriage. A wedding is going to be happening. So that's kind of where we're picking up. We're seeing some things that are a bad situation turning to good and how God's really been behind it all. So look at verse 13 now. We catch up with the story. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then she went to her then he went to her, excuse me, and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. So we're starting to really see the story change even for better now. But I want to say God can bring out good and bad. I got ahead of myself here a moment. God can bring good out of a bad for a family. We're seeing that in the family of Naomi and Ruth. God can bring good out of a bad for a nation. And I should add world. As we go on through this story, if you know the story of Ruth, that's a fact, how good things came out of this story that's impacted you and I today. So we're in verse 13. There's a, uh, a wedding. A marriage takes place. Uh, the Lord, it says here, enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Take note of that. God, God brought the blessing of that son. God brings the blessing of a, a new life in this world. Verse 14. It gets very interesting now. Okay? Verse 14. The women, so that's the women of the community, uh, say to Naomi, okay, that's the mother in law, okay? The mother in law and the grandmother, new grandmother, said, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Okay, interesting. Some things here, questions you may have, but they start off 
the community, the ladies proclaim praise to the Lord. They're recognizing God has a hand in all of this. And that there's a kinsman redeemer. But can I ask you a question if you're reading along here? Who's the kinsman redeemer in this, this description? Hmm? Is it really? Good answer. That's the obvious answer. It's the grandson. Yeah, in the context, it's the grandson. Okay, Dan, I, I would agree with you. I mean, it seems like Boaz is. He's been, that's his purpose, and he brought this land, and he married Ruth. But now they're saying, here's a kinsman redeemer, this grandson of Naomi. So what's that mean? They're saying, there is hope for this family again. There's a descendant. The line of this family is going to continue on. Uh, and it's and this boy, they, we pray that he'll become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life, talking to Naomi, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. So, you know, whatever happens maybe to Boaz and Ruth, Naomi, this, God, this grandson is going to take care of you. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than your seven, than seven sons has given him birth. So they praise Ruth that she's given birth to this and, and just her reputation and her character. Ruth is praised that she's better than seven sons. Seven sons. I knew a guy and wife, they had six daughters and they finally had their seventh child, a boy. And everybody kept saying to them, well, you finally got your boy. Huh? You, you want all, and it's like, God bless me. I don't care what I got, you know, and just, uh, but just somehow in that culture, seven sons would be awesome, they're saying. Uh, seven sons to, today. Oh, my. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. But uh, seven sons, that Ruth is better than that. So, I mean, the blessings that they see that Ruth brings to Naomi, Verse 16, then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. So maybe again, grandma is taking some mothering and helping with the parenting type of chores going on there. The women, the women living here there said, Naomi has a son. She had lost her sons earlier, right? Lost her husband. Now there again, there's a kinsman redeemer emphasis even in this grandson. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, if we're still going on, that the women here named him Obed. Kind of strange, you know? Be like, Lori and I having another child. I'm not going to. We're past that. Only the Lord would bring that miracle. And he always brings the miracles. But uh, if we would have another child, and we don't name the child, but we're going to have you guys come over to the house and let's pick a name together. It's not going to happen. You're not going to come to my house and do that either. I was just sharing with somebody uh, uh, the other day. Uh, I knew a guy. He's with the Lord now. And uh, when he was born, um, his parents didn't really have a name figured out for him. So it was getting like time to discharge him in the hospital. You know, they want to know the facts and they have to put all these records to the government. And uh, his birth certificate, and he even showed me his birth certificate when I was in his house, that his last name was Lemke, okay? The, the birth certificate said, baby boy Lemke. And he had never got it changed. He just left to go. His name was Lloyd. But uh, amazing, you know, and what, again, here... Why, why would this be? Really, what the, the people did was they gave him a nickname, okay? We believe his name was really uh, Obadiah, Obadiah. And Obed is short for Obadiah, and meaning the same thing. Obadiah means servant of Yahweh, and Obed means servant. So again, they were hoping that he would serve God, Yahweh, and serve Naomi and her family, and this young man, or the baby, Obed. So we see again, we're seeing good things are happening from bad. God is praised. He's provided a kinsman redeemer. 
Naomi gained a family. Now she has Ruth, Boaz, Obed. And there's a family line continuing. Okay, a family line continuing. Look at verse, now going on, verse 18. Then this, excuse me, this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amadamadad. <laughs> Amadamadad, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salam. Salam, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Now, some of those names I'm never going to repeat again. Okay? I'm never going to repeat again. First service, I did much better on those names. But the second part of that right there, okay? Salam, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. You recognize some names there? Besides Boaz and Obed, there's a guy named Jesse who has a son named David. You see where this is going again? God is good. He brings his goodness through bad times. He has a plan that's going to be carried out. It can't be dwarfed. It may uh, just look, what are you doing, God? But he is in action. He's sovereign. He's leading. So let's go into the book of Matthew. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to just put some portion of scripture here. Matthew 1, we have another genealogy listed here, just like in Ruth. And you'll see some similarities. This is the genealogy, of, excuse me, the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. And then it goes on further. I'm just skipping over some things, and we come to something we just read. Verses 5 and 6. Salam, the father of Boaz, Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Recognize that name? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the line, you think, this is the line of Jesus. And, but if you would go do a study of just the names mentioned there, I encourage you to do that. Get a concordance where it lists all the names and, uh, and, and words in the Bible and look up these people's names and their stories. And so we know about Ruth. Uh, what was her reputation? What was her reputation? She was what? Kind of, kind of seen as a prostitute, right? That was one assumption about her is that she was a prostitute. What? Yet she's in the line of, David, of Jesus. Amazing, right? What God does and uses people and changes their lives. Changes their lives. And the faith that is expressed by Rahab and the transformation, I'm sure, in her life. But Salom, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz's mom was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Again, there's a lot of history packed into that. But it starts way back 1,200 years ago when there was a famine, a bad thing. And a bad choice by a family to go to a territory where God is not honored. But we find a conversion of a young woman named Ruth that wants to follow Yahweh. And God honors that. And God's not surprised by this. And in your troubles, God's not surprised by it. He will use it if you follow then we just go on verses 15 and 16. We skip some more names there. Ehud, the father of Elzar. Elzar, the father of Methon. Methon, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Again, started 1,200 years, or actually much more than it. It goes all the way back to Abraham, right? God has a plan. God is sovereign. God is providence, that he cares for his people, his creation. 
That's part of the storyline of Ruth. So there we come to the end of our story. So let's back up and look over this story. What are some lessons you can learn from the book of Ruth? We've learned a lot, but let's just summarize it down a little bit here. Okay? First, see God in the ordinary events of life. See God in the ordinary events of life. I've used the word this week a couple times and other weeks, the word providence. The care and supervision of God over his creation. He didn't just make the world and then step out of it. You know, some believe that, that God started it. They would be called maybe deist, and that they believe there's a God, but that he was kind of like alarm clock. You wind the clock up, set it, and he, he put it in a box, but he never goes in to touch, the, touch it. I believe God's always involved. Don't you? I hope so. So God has a providential care over us. But we need to see God in the ordinary events. Maybe reflect over the past week. Reflect over the past week. Is there any things you can see where God definitely was, can be seen? Or maybe you just didn't see it. And but in reflection on it, you can see God involved there. He's involved in the ordinary events in our life. Next, trust God in the perplexing events of life. Things get trying. Perplexing, you know, causes a lot of questions, right? You don't understand it. What's going to do here, God? You know, you may have gotten a, a bad prognosis. You may have gotten a, a layoff notice. You may have gotten a bill that just said, when did that, you know, I thought this was going to be taken care of by insurance. How am I going to take care of this? Broken relationships, so forth and on, on and on. It would be endless to go over these perplexing situations in our life. But do you see and trust God through it all? Do you trust God through it all? When you don't know what God is up to, be assured that he does know what to do. Even in bad times, he's up to something good. And we see that in the story of Ruth. And a scripture I've almost shared every Sunday in this series, Romans 8, 28 and 29. Hope you have it memorized. It was one of our living by the word scriptures at one time. Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of, the, of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God works all things for the good of those who love him, his children he blesses, he cares for. He's sovereign over, he has a provincial, providential care over you then magnify God in the events of life. When you see God working, don't minimize it. Don't take it for granted. Magnify, say, make your God big. He's a big God. Praise him. Tell others about it. Give a testimony of how God's worked. Let others see how he works. He deserves our worship, our praise, our and bring glory to his name. These are some of the lessons we learned from Ruth. There's many more. But let's talk about redemption. Did you catch there was a theme in our worship today about redemption? The deep love of, of, God, of Jesus. The, uh, there is a redeemer. And, uh, but redemption means to buy out. To buy out. The action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. I, a sinner, Pat, born with a sinful nature, acting on that sinful nature. I'm a sinner. I need redemption. I need to be bought out of the penalty of my sin, which is death and eternal separation from God. At the age of 10, I came to the realization 
of the gospel truth that Jesus loves me, he died for me, he rose again for me, he paid the penalty for my sins. I hope you have discovered that same thing. Because if not, you're a sinner damned to hell. Sorry for that strong language if you think about it, but it's a truth. And he's separation and a hopelessness from God. But with redemption, receiving by faith God's grace, I've been forgiven. I've been given eternal life. I've been given power and truth to live in this life as Christ. And so have you, if you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that you've been born again, we will call it. And that's what Jesus said. So that's redemption. And if you turn your, script, your sermon outline over this week, there's a lot of scriptures in the recalibrate part there, all about redemption. Redemption. And I hope you'll read them, pray about them, and, and just grow in faith and understanding of what redemption is by Jesus. One of those scriptures is Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. The dominion of darkness. At age 10, when I confess Jesus as my Savior and Lord and ask for His forgiveness and the gift of eternal life and His salvation, the truth happened. I was rescued out of the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of Jesus, His Son. He loves and in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you still struggle with what this idea of redemption just remember, Jesus paid the price for the forgiveness of your sins, to save you from your sins. That's redemption. I want to close by asking you a question to think about as we have a song at the end here. Have you been redeemed? Have you been redeemed? Have you accepted what Jesus did at the cross to buy you into salvation in a sense that he paid the penalty he paid the cost to redeem you out of your lostness your hopelessness and to bring you into hope and life and an eternity with him have you been redeemed and i want to share this story with you You 
Are you redeemed? Bow your heads in prayer with me. Do you have an answer to that question? Are you redeemed? If you've been redeemed, will you just raise your hand in acknowledgement of that? Nobody's looking around. Just raise your hand. Thanks. Place it down. But then a question follows up. If you couldn't raise your hand, why? Maybe it's the first time you ever heard that you need to be redeemed. Perhaps you've heard the truth for some time and you've just been, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to give up my life. Well, a new life is waiting for you, which is much better. Why delay? Let me pray for you. Lord, we raise our hands as a testimony, as a witness to our faith that we have a Redeemer who paid the price that we deserve to pay for our sins, death, and you saw how hopeless we were, and your heart was broken over our lostness, the separation from you. You see how destructive sin is in our lives. So you sent a Redeemer, a Savior, Jesus, the Son of God. We confess that. We believe that. And that by receiving by faith your grace in Jesus, we have a new life. We have a life that has hope. It can have peace. It can have an eternity with you and a life now for eternity. We thank you, Lord. And I pray for those who couldn't raise their hand. And they have their answer to why they had they did not but may you just keep calling them showing them the truth showing them your grace maybe they're really in a bad situation life's been hard for them and it's hard to accept that you're a good god and a loving god and you show mercy and you want the best for them may 
even in their trials, they will start to see your hand, your care of them. And all of us, may we see how sovereign you are over all things, how even in bad things and bad decisions we make, your plan will be achieved because you are sovereign and you are God and we are not. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you have questions about what we heard in, from the scripture today, and again, you're dealing with redemption, and you couldn't raise your hand, that's okay, we're not here to guilt you, but I want to help you that you can say that Jesus is your Redeemer and Savior. So I'm going to remain here. You're going to be dismissed. Sorry, I can't welcome you as I normally do as you depart. Again, uh, you can see me after this, but or even this week, make a contact to me. I love to talk to you more about Jesus, our Redeemer. May the Lord bless you. May he lead you this week with his truth and his power. May you see how great our God is and may you magnify him and worship him and praise him as your redeemer. Amen.